Welcome to the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. I'm Leon. I'd like to start a new video series that is a step-by-step -step method of designing an ultralight airplane. And we're going to base this on Dan Raymer's book, Simplified Aircraft Design for Home Builders. This book is about the closest I've ever seen for a step-by-step -step method for designing an airplane. But we're going to do an example of how to do an ultralight airplane design using this book. Now first I want to say that this series that we're going to do is not a replacement for Dan's book. Dan's book is going to have a lot more interesting detail in it than I'm going to present in this video series. This series is just going to be taking the information from his book and applying it to a design for an ultralight airplane. And by the way, if you want to get Dan's book, I'll put a link to it down in the description for this video. That'll be an Amazon Associates link, and so if you use that link to purchase the book, the channel will get a little cut of the proceeds. What prompted this video series is I was asked a question recently on if there were step-by-step -step guides or procedures for designing an ultralight airplane. My knee-jerk response was no, but I thought about it for a minute and I thought, well, Raymer's book isn't too bad. I had used Raymer's book back in August on a little side project and I got to thinking, you know, Raymer's book is almost step-by-step. -step. So my response was, Raymer's book comes close for the aerodynamic part of it, but when you come to the structural part of it, there really isn't a step-by-step -step procedure. Although, we may have a future video series on this airplane we're going to design and maybe go through the design process for a particular material which can be close to a step-by-step -step process. Another thing that prompted this design series is it's starting to get cold. We're at the end of October now. In fact, we had our first snow today. And it's going to get a little bit colder here in the shop. We have electric heat in the shop, but that's kind of expensive, so I won't be out in the shop as much. And I want a project to do at my desk that I could do during these cold weather months to kind of keep things progressing. One of the things we will be doing in the shop this winter is finishing up this mold for the UWS-1 Ultralight Airplane. This is the mold for a rudder half. And then once I get that done, I really need to go back to do some composite testing. So I'm going to create a rig to do some shear testing on some parts so I can find out what the shear can be on some of these samples of carbon fiber that I've made so I can finally decide on what the skin's going to be for this rudder and for various parts of the ultralight airplane. So that's going to be some of the things I'm doing out in the shop when I'm willing to use up some money to heat up the shop for a couple days at a time. Well let's go back to the office and let's get started on this new design series. We're going to call this ultralight the UWS-1-4. And that's because UWS-2 is already for a stall design and UWS-3 is for a sailplane design. This is basically a table of contents for Raymer's book and the sections of that table of contents that we're going to use. For this video, we're going to go over design goals and then we're going to do power loading and wing loading. And the rest of these we will save for future videos. Raymer says that you should come up with your design goals before you try to start doing your design. And I agree. If you don't have a goal in mind, you can't figure out a path to get to that goal. Design goals are going to be a little bit different for this one compared to the UWS-1 Ultralight. Actually, I had the ideas for the design back in August, and I put off deciding whether I'm going to do videos on this until this month when I decided, you know, let's go ahead and do it. It'd be a good project for the winter months. So the main purpose for this ultralight, instead of sightseeing, it's going to be for cruising. And by that, I mean flying to various local airfields to go visiting. Now, most ultralights are not really suited for this because they have a very limited range. But that's going to be the goal for this one. So in this one, a view down is not a high priority. It'd be nice, but it's not a high priority. I also intend to use aluminum construction for this airplane if we build it. And so any design considerations where the materials used in the construction would be a factor, we're going to assume aluminum construction. There could be some variations on that. We may use steel tubing for the structure of the cabin. That's for safety purposes. We'll get into that a little bit later. I might use fabric covering for the control surfaces if it will save some weight. And a lot of the construction for the airplane we're going to borrow from the Hummel Cruiser. I've got plans for that, and I like that it's an all-aluminum airplane, and since we're going to use aluminum construction, it's actually not a bad starting place. We're going to use some lightweight design techniques, 
and I'll put a video up here in the upper right hand corner of a video I made about how to choose the plan form for the wing in order to make it light. Actually, I covered a whole bunch of other things in there too. For example, wing span, fuselage length, and a few other things. And the main thing we came away with from that video is a low aspect ratio is a much lighter wing design and it makes the airplane lighter. So we'll keep that in mind during this design. Where we can, we're going to reduce drag, but we're not going to do it at the expense of light weight. Now we might go ahead and make some trade-offs where drag will take some precedence and add a little bit of weight, but if trying to do a drag reduction would add a lot of weight, we won't do it. And I have an example of that we'll talk about in a later video. We're going to use simple construction techniques, and an example of that would be pull rivets instead of driven rivets. And the thing I'm thinking about possibly doing is making a carbon fiber version of this airplane. And maybe only a few parts. For example, I might take an aileron and make an aluminum version and a carbon fiber version and see if I could find much difference between them. I think it'd be kind of a fun thing to do for at least a few parts. We got our goals, but there are some things that are required. Now, goals are things you would like to do. You definitely want to do, but you might have to compromise on them a little bit. Requirements are things you absolutely have to do. This is not explicitly in Dan Raymer's book, but I think it really should be. I think it should have its own section. In our case, the only requirement is to meet FAA Part 103 regulations. If you're new to the channel, FAA stands for Federal Aviation Administration, and Part 103 is part of the aviation regulations that covers ultralight airplanes. It covers how you can operate an ultralight, the restrictions on operations, and it covers restrictions on the airplane. I've talked about this quite a bit in other videos, but let me summarize it real quick. The empty weight of your airplane, that's a plane without fuel, without pilot, without baggage, has to be less than 254 pounds. The maximum level flight cruise speed cannot be more than 55 knots, that's about 63 miles an hour. The landing configuration stall speed, and that's the speed you're configured to land at. Now, if you have flaps, that means you have your flaps extended. If you have retractable gear, that means you have your gear extended. That speed cannot be more than 24 knots. That's around 28 miles per hour. You also cannot have more than 5 gallons of fuel. And as far as design goes, that's really the major components. There are a few Osnans, like you're allowed about 24 pounds for a parachute. If you're designing it to be a float plane, you got a little more weight allowance. And there are a few other odds and ends, but that's really the major things that we have to meet. I'm not really adding any other requirements. So the next thing in Raymer's book is power loading. And that's essentially a little equation that's the weight of the airplane divided by the horsepower of the airplane. Now this is something that we'll use a little bit later when we're working on the engine selection for the airplane. Now, if you don't know your engine horsepower or your weight ahead of time, Raymer has a list of various estimations for coming up with it. And for ultralights, he actually has one in there. Occasionally, you'll find that Raymer has a few of these simplifications for ultralights. For the most part, he's putting in things for light airplanes and heavy airplanes and bigger airplanes, but occasionally he has a little something for ultralights. And for power loading, he actually has something in here. This is the equation he uses where V max is actually your maximum cruising speed. So if we plug our 55 knots in here, we come up with a power loading of 16.1. And like I said, we'll use this a little bit later when we're trying to select our engine. And the next thing is wing loading. And you probably know a little bit about wing loading. That's the weight of your airplane divided by the swing surface area of your airplane or in SI units, it'd be newtons per square meter. Now, if you don't know your surface area or wing yet, you don't know your weight yet, we need to come up with some kind of estimation. Well, one way to do that is to use a variation on the lift equation. And this should look very familiar. Some of you folks have looked at the lift equation in here. So this is our wing loading, which is equal to Q, which is dynamic pressure multiplied the coefficient of lift of our wing. And by the way, if you're new to the channel, I have a playlist that's called the Aero Terminology Playlist. And one of the videos in that playlist covers the coefficient of lift. So if you're not familiar with the coefficient of lift, I'll put a link up here in the upper right hand corner where you can go and find that video. Well, let's figure this out for our stall speed. 
because we know what our coefficient of lift is going to be at stall, and I'll talk about it in a moment. We definitely know what Q is, because Q is directly related to speed. Our stall speed is 24 knots, so we can actually come up with Q at our stall speed. I'm actually showing it down here, so Q is one half of rho times our landing configuration stall speed. So one half times 0 0.00238 slugs. Now that's standard air pressure at sea level at standard temperature. And we convert our speed from knots into feet per second. So that's 40 and a half feet per second. So our Q at stall, our dynamic pressure is 1.95. I just realized while I was editing this video, I made a mistake. This velocity should be squared and it should be squared here. I did the calculation right, I squared it for this calculation, but I forgot to put it on the slide correctly. So the only thing we have left to figure out is the coefficient of lift for our wing. Well, we can actually get that from the FAA Advisory Circular 103-7 Appendix 2. If we have a double-sided wing and we have flaps that extend more than 75% of the span, actually that's not right, that's supposed to be 50%. If our flaps extend more than 50% of the span, then we can use a maximum coefficient of lift of our wing, and we're using a maximum coefficient of lift when we're landing at stall of 2.0. So let's put in our lift equation. So we have the 1.95 for Q, our coefficient of maximum lift, 2.0. So our wing loading is 3.9 pounds per square foot. Let me go back and put those units in here and let me fix this 50% span. Now that we have our wing loading, we need to save that because we're going to use that just a little bit later. And before you tune out of the video, I want to let you know that there's a little surprise at the end of this video. Since it's kind of short, I want to add a little bit extra for you. A little surprise, something a little special. Let's talk about the next things we're going to do in the next video in this series. We're going to do two major things, sizing the airplane itself and then sizing the engine. Now, sizing the airplane consists of coming up with some drag estimates, some fuel estimates, and some weight estimates for the airplane. And then engine sizing also includes coming up with the uh, propeller diameter. We'll at least do that much. It may not take much time to do that, but the next thing to come after that is going to be wing sizing, and I want to do that in a separate video. So the next video may be fairly short because it won't take too long to go through these things. Don't forget that down in the description for this video, there's a link to Dan Raber's book that you can click and go to buy it if you want to. And before we end, I also want to thank my patrons. Keith and Richard have been fantastic long-term supporters of the channel at the designer tier. And Ryan is a fairly recent supporter and he's at the early bird tier. I want to thank you guys for supporting the channel. And now let's get to our little surprise ending. During the summer, I work on a professional fireworks shoot team. And this year, because of the pandemic, we've had almost no shows, but we did have a July 4th show. And I wanted to show you some of the pictures I took during that show.